tonight is a real privilege because tonight we have the author of this astonishing book. It's even worse than you think. What the Trump administration is doing to America, okay? And this, and I want you to know, this book has just come out and just started out hitting the New York Times bestseller list at number two on nonfiction. Congratulations, David, that's astonishing. That's important. That's wonderful. I know that there's other stuff out there with a lot of gossip. This is a lot of the reality. When, the, when you stop chuckling, this is the rest. <laughs> okay, very important. So it is with um, great pleasure and an honor to introduce David K. Johnston. You know, I, what, the big thing I get asked by people is, what do you mean it's worse than, I, than you think? And the reason we gave it that title is very simple. This book is about what you have not heard in the news. What you've heard in the news is really very good coverage of the palace intrigues in the White House, of the interpersonal displays and fights that are going on, and the chaos and the craziness. But what matters is what you haven't heard, and that's what Trump and his team are doing to our government. They have loosed political termites into the structure of our government. And any of you who have ever been told one day, well, <clears throat> you have a large repair bill. Uh, there were these invisible little creatures eating your house behind the walls. That's what's happening to our government. And that's what the book is about, to get people to understand that this isn't just fall to roll and nonsense and stupidity. This is really serious stuff about your health, your safety, your employment, and a whole bunch of other things. Okay, well, I have a... Uh notes. Now we did have a quiz. I'd you sent out to a press card up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I do. You know, the BBC doesn't requires me to wear a hat whenever I'm on camera and Britain. I'm the man. If you're watching from Britain, you know, I'm the man in the hat. Okay. Um, now uh, a question I did send out and I, uh, the first people who could, who could correctly answer this question, who is this? And you'll give the answer because it's from your book, a narcissistic, no nothing con artist who has spent his life swindling others while repeatedly urging followers to commit criminal acts of violence against his critics. Oh, Mr. Melania Noss. <laughs> yeah. So serious, yeah. Why, you know, um, why is it worse? Let's see, I'll ask that, that open question to begin with, but why is it worse than we think? I mean, because, you know, I've, it's not if you saw my film and people have, and, but you've really been following this guy for decades, for decades, and that's why you have a special insight. Why is he worse than, than you know, Tricky Dick, um, who's killed three million Vietnamese? <coughs> well, you know, we've had 44 pr prior presidents. We've had smart ones, we've had dumb ones, we've had uh, middling ones, we've had ones who had no sense of focus, we've had great ones. But all of them, every single one of them, even the murderous racist Andrew Jackson, whose portrait hangs in the Oval Office right now, even Chester Arthur, the most corrupt imaginable New York City Paul, who became president only because he was vice president and his president died a month into office, all of them tried to make America better. Even Chester Arthur, who, who called his cronies in and said, uh, who all went there thinking, oh boy, we got the White House now, we're gonna get rich. And he said, excuse me, gentlemen, I'm now the President of the United States, do not darken the White House door again, go. And he gave us the Pendleton Civil Service Act, which if you listened last night to the State of the Union address, Donald Trump wants to undo. All of those presidents tried in the context of their times to make the country better. Some failed, some succeeded, some had ideas that we should be glad didn't succeed, some had ideas we should wish succeeded, but they all tried to make the country better. Donald Trump is about exactly one thing. Donald Trump, period, full stop. It is the glorification of the genetically superior, self-described greatest memory in the world, except when he can't recall. Super genius, world's leading expert on at least 20 subjects, can learn everything you need to know about nuclear weapons in 90 minutes, Donald Trump. 
And this is a cult of personality leader. And what's astonishing is, you know, he, he held a meeting in, in what I think we can now call the studio, used to be known as the cabinet room because he called it the studio, where he talked about how his performance was rated and everybody, everybody was really great. News anchors wrote me letters. You know, it's amazing. I, I've noticed the post office can deliver letters, you know, with the speed of Superman to the White House. And uh, Donald Trump has now entered season two of Trump, the White House reality show. Unfortunately, it's worse than a farce. He's putting your life in danger, your children's life in danger. They're hiding information. They're destroying information. They're getting rid of people that you as taxpayers have spent a fortune developing expertise in diplomacy, military backgrounds, law enforcement, investigations, prosecutions, civil litigation, all as part of the glorification of Donald Trump. Uh, David, I want to follow up on that. You said that they're just getting rid of people. It sounds like they're using, you know, stamping on on the ants in the in the government. You know, aren't we just getting rid of red tape? So who's getting what are who have we lost that's so darn important? I mean, I heard them say, uh, you know, we have 650 agencies. Let's just lop off a few. Well, seriously. Uh, first of all, Trump came into office and he fired wholesale the 90 United States attorneys. Now, legally he has the right to do that, but normally you wait and leave in office the people who are there who want to stay mm -hmm. until you've got somebody to replace them. We still have acting U.S. attorneys in a lot of places. Acting U.S. attorneys do not, as a general rule, make bold decisions about pursuing bad guys, bad hombres. Uh, in diplomacy, Trump summarily fired every ambassador around the world, career ambassadors as well as political ambassadors. And until a few weeks ago, a majority of embassies did not have an ambassador. Donald is constantly worried about, you know, not just the murderous Mexicans, but the Muslim terrorists. You know, we can't let people into certain countries, and apparently we can't let ambassadors into Libya, Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, sort of places you might think you want to have an ambassador if you're worried about those issues. Um, we don't have an ambassador to Australia. What country in the world is more loyal, more lapdog, yes, America, whatever you want, please, please, just pet us, than Australia? And we don't have an ambassador there. And what it means that when big trade deals are being discussed, when somebody's thinking about building an auto plant or making a science investment, we don't have the right person at the table, and we may have no one at the table. In many countries, having an ambassador at the table who gets invited to the highest level parties is important because noticing that the dictator's son shows up with a new mistress can be of great significance in the area of national security. We don't have people doing these things. Um, in the Environmental Protection Agency, there are all sorts of scientists have been told you may not go to conferences, you may not speak certain words, and it's not the seven words George Carlin made famous. <laughs> Uh, you may not pursue your scientific research. I, in my books, I don't, I don't write dry poli-sci books. I, well, I teach. I wasn't actually a professor. I'm a lecturer. But I tell these through the stories of people. And one of the stories I tell is a woman named Betsy Sutherland, who was a career manager in the Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, one day, she is told that uh, she is to have her staff begin preparing reports on the vulnerabilities of any pollution enforcement cases the people under her command might bring. And they're to do it in exhaustive detail. You know, no potential weaknesses, no potential problem with enforcing the law is to be ignored. And then they're called to a meeting. They're asked a few questions about it. Their work is taken, and it disappears. And of course, the reasonable assumption is that Scott Pruitt who hopes to be the future senator from Fossil Fuels, Oklahoma, uh, turned this over to ExxonMobil and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and big utility companies so that they could go on doing their business and not worry that if, if the government were to ever come after them, maybe in some future administration, they'd know how to get out of the case. And this is going on just all through our government. I just want to catch that correctly. You're saying that... There, that uh that Pruitt is slipping 
the corporations that are being regulated. Well, what else is he doing? I mean, we don't literally know because they won't talk. But what we know is they get, he asked, demanded all this information. They work to get it all because they're good bureaucrats, and bureaucrats do what they're told. And they produced the information, and it was taken from them. And they were never asked another question. They were just told, drink a lot of coffee in the cafeteria because there's nothing for you to do. Mm. Okay, well, a couple things there. Um, um, you were saying we don't know what they're doing. All right, right. Free, let me get to something in your book about the Freedom of Information Act. So the, I have a couple questions. Do we still have freedom and do we have any information? <laughs> and uh, seriously, how's, uh, how, well, how of, are we able to crack these guys? One, one of the chapters in my book is called Go FOIA Yourself. <laughs> uh, because the Trump administration, even during confirmation hearings, you know, has said to senators who ask questions, well, go file an FOIA. I asked the, uh, the government for a copy of a receipt or other proof of payment of a $100 million penalty that was supposedly paid by one of the big banks. I mean, it's a simple request. I just want to see that it was actually paid. You know, whatever you call it, a receipt. And, and by the way, the company, if it paid it, has to have it because this one is a tax-deductible penalty. So they've got to be able to document it. And first, there was no response. Then we got a letter offering us all sorts of totally unrelated information. And finally, I was told, go FOA yourself. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a real problem here. The Freedom of Information Act has been weakened for years. Uh, agencies delay and defer, and they come up with, there's an FOIA listserv that I belong to um, with a bunch of other people. And the most creative responses come up to things, you know. You say, I would like to get all the expense accounts for X. And they say, we have no records. And then you find out that, well, they don't call it an expense account. They call it a record of expenditures. <laughs> and all sorts of game playing like this has been going on. But under Trump, it's gotten to be, it got, it got bad under Obama. It's gotten unbelievably worse under Donald Trump. You talked about taking apart these agencies. You talked about Scott Pruitt and his kind of vampirical sucking of the information out of his, out of his uh, professional staff to give to the people he's supposed to regulate. Okay. Now let's go to another regulatory agency that you've taken uh, apart and, and watched as they're taking apart called the FERC. Could you tell me what, what, who, how? And he's only been, Trump's only been in office a year. People keep saying he's done nothing, by the way. So I think what, what the, the real thing that I found astonishing, uh, really worthwhile about David's book, is that he's done a lot, but it's in the dark. Okay, so let's start with the FERC. Okay. Well, for, I don't know, almost 50 years, I've written about electricity regulation monopolies and what are known as investor-owned electric utilities, IOUs, I prefer to call them corporate-owned, as opposed to municipally-owned, cooperatively-owned electric utilities. And the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, is this little tiny federal agency. It's got like 1,500 employees out of 2 million civilians who work for the federal government. And almost nobody's ever heard of it. It is funded in a most unusual way. Well, the Bush administration and the Obama administration were cutting budgets. FERC's budget kept growing and growing and growing because FERC, which is supposed to look out for you to make sure that all prices you pay for electricity, natural gas, pipelines, are what the law calls just and reasonable. Just and reasonable profits balanced against just and reasonable prices. And how is this agency funded? by the energy companies, not the taxpayers. Guess where its interests tend to lie? I have described the, uh, until recently, the chairperson of this commission as a sightless sheriff, and suggested that, you know, were she assigned to go investigate reports of why large numbers of cars are seen to pull up in front of a house and men go inside and they're there for about an hour and they come back and then they drive away, that she would no doubt walk in, note a piano player, men in suits and women in lingerie and go back and report there's nothing going on, they're playing music. <laughs> uh, so Trump comes into office and almost literally the day he takes the oath of office, he sends a signal to Wall Street. 
Now, how many of you know that many of the electric power plants in America are no longer owned by utility companies or energy companies? They're owned by Wall Street traders. Yeah, well, Donald immediately sent a signal by demoting the only person on the five-member commission, Norman Bay, former U.S. Attorney for New Mexico, from chairman to regular commissioner, at which point he quit. He'd been humiliated promoted to chairperson the sightless sheriff who just happens to be the former CEO of National Grid, a British-owned electric utility that's in the uh, northeast and parts of New York State, upstate where I live, and has made other appointments. One of his commissioners referred to public protests by people about the damage fracking is doing in Pennsylvania, largely not environmental damage, but the roads that are being beaten to pieces by heavy trucks, as the, he calls the people who protested, protested jihadists. <laughs> and these are the kind of people now at FERC. And what you will see happen, I'm confident over time, is prices will rise. And there's a simple, I'll get wonky with you, economic principle yeah. here. The idea of separating the transmission of electricity from the generation of it, is that transmission is a natural monopoly, unless any of you want 12 electric lines running down your street. And there was a time, by the way, when that happened more than 100 years ago. But there's no reason that power plants need to be monopolies. And the theory is that people will look at a spike in electric prices, where the cost of making electricity is, say, $3 a unit, and they're getting $3,000 a unit and say, hey, let's go build a power plant and cash in on that, which will bring the price down to maybe $1,000 a unit. Well, that's textbook economics of what I was taught at the University of Chicago. In the real world, people who own power plants go, oh, let's go buy a power plant and shut it down and we can get $5,000 an hour. And in fact, some Wall Street guys from Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank bought 17 power plants in New England. And the most expensive one is probably half what they paid. Five weeks after they bought it, they announced they were shutting it down. And they, you would say, well, wait a minute, why would you spend $300 million to buy an electricity factory and then close it? Well, because it'll raise revenues by almost $2 billion a year. That's why. You'd be an idiot not to do so if you're allowed to. And this is, goes right to the heart of Donald Trump's absolute lying to the American people when he said, I'm the champion of the forgotten man. I alone will save you. I'm the only one who cares about you. And at every campaign stop, I love you. We love you. I love you. We love you. We love our cops. We love our firefighters. We don't love our Muslims. And here he is actively working to help Wall Street. He ran against Wall Street. He ran specifically against Goldman Sachs to help these people reach into your pocket and unjustly and unreasonably drain money out of it. So there you are. So while he supposedly didn't do anything, wait till your electric bill comes in. That's what it comes down to. It is reverse Robin Hood that, that you're talking about. Yeah. By the way, one pop quiz, who actually first appointed the, uh, who appointed that uh, sightless sheriff? Oh, that was, uh, uh, that appointment I think took place during George W. Bush, but oh. I could be wrong. It may have been during Barack Obama. That's... Hmm? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, one of the... It, it may have been Barack Obama. I'd have to go back and look at the record about it. But presidents in both parties have basically, you know, they look, look, we have a campaign finance system in this country adopted because of Watergate that was supposed to reform the system. And instead, it created the political donor class. And you don't get to run for president of the United States if the one in 500 households who finance campaigns and Wall Street don't find you acceptable. You know, they found Barack Obama to be acceptable. And he's the guy who did not pursue the corrupt bankers. Thousands of bankers should have gone to jail. And they would have if they just listened. If they had, if they had just listened to Bill Black, the guy who got 3,000 felony convictions and 800 high-level SNL executives sent to prison 25 years ago. But in Donald's case, you know, this isn't a function of not pursuing the crooks who sank the economy, in Donald's case, it's, oh, let's bring them in. They can run Treasury. They can run all sorts of government departments. 
Thank you. Because, <laughs> well, yeah, because what I wanted, the, the important thing is, is um, so that you're not accused of being partisan. You've gone after all these guys, oh, right? Yeah. That, and so I, that, I mean, that's very important. I, I was the guy who proved that Eric Holder knowingly lied when he said repeatedly for 10 months that the Obama administration was, gonna, was building cases against the big bankers in Wall Street. And I got the documents to prove he was told that's not true, and for 10 months he kept lying about it. Um, what would you think of this statement? Um, the current U.S. political system is corrupt and dominated by corporations. <laughs> yeah, you got news for me? Uh. <laughs> yeah, think about this, Greg. Imagine that you decided to run for Congress out in Sunland where you live uh -huh. and went, well, when I get to Congress, well, we know what Greg Ballast would do, right? Except as soon as you got to Congress, you would find out that you're going to serve exactly one term unless you play ball with the people who have money because they'll do what they did to Senator Johnston, no relation in Utah, a principled Republican. They ran Mike Lee against him, and he lost. That's why Jeff Flake can't run. Flakes are the first family of Arizona. They named a town for him, Snowflake. And he cannot run for another term because he'll be run at and destroyed from the right. If you're running to the right of Jeff Flake, you're really out there. Oh. <laughs> Actually, let me, I, I, I deserve to have one of my stories then, uh, which is that. Um, it's about running for office? <laughs> back in uh, 1995, and by the way, this is a good moment to have just a, a, a thought and, a, and uh, a memory of the greatest American investigative reporter who was our until this week, our greatest investigative reporter passed away, Bob Perry, oh. who passed away this week of uh, pancreatic cancer. And um, it was in 1995. I was an investigator, by the way. I was doing uh, power companies' uh, investigations, FERC stuff. And, and um, uh, I was working for the U.S. Justice Department and others, and the Attorney General of New Mexico. And doing. I was an investigator before I was an investigative reporter. I actually had a job, you know, before as a journalist. <laughs> and. Um, and I started digging into these, uh, to these guys that no one had ever heard of because there was oil missing from an Indian reservation. And, and this guy, Charles Koch and David, and his brother, David Koch, and they were, sh they, were, they were literally stealing five bucks from each Indian family a week on this reservation. I can't make that up. And that's where, by the way, you've heard the phrase, but I got that from my FBI wiretap, which is that um, he was, uh, someone asked Koch, Charles, why are you stealing $5 from an Indian family? He's already a billionaire. This was senior vice president Williams asking him, and, and Koch said, I want my fair share, and that's all of it. And um, so Bob Perry, in 95, was uh, telling me about uh, these characters, Koch, and uh, so he said, call Senator DeConcini. You're talking about senators who are wiped out. Okay, he was the he was the Democratic senator from Arizona. Um, it uh, it is a purple state if you let people vote. I mean, it's a blue state if you let people vote. And um, DeConcini told me, he said he did a hearing on the Cokes stealing oil from the Indians. He said it, this was abs the biggest case of theft from the U.S. government because it's also native land, it's also U.S. government land. We, we as Americans split the royalties. They were stealing from the natives. They were stealing about, we were running about $160 million in theft. Those $3 thefts add up. And DeConcini wrote that down in a report. He was head of the Senate Investigations Committee at the time. And um, before he reached his conclusion, uh, he got a visit from Coke, from Charles, who said, I just want to tell you that if you say one word about what happened to that oil, I will spend whatever it takes. But I will, you will not only lose re-election, you will be destroyed. And that's exactly what happened to Senator DeConcini. Okay? And just to be clear, stuff like this has always gone on in Washington. Here's what's different about Trump. He isn't motivated by the same things you think that other people are. It's not political support. It's not doing favors here and there. He's being motivated here by glorifying himself and moving as fast as he can in the general direction of being a dictator. Just listen to how he talks. 
He talks like a dictator. The, the, these dumb judges, you know, these didn't do what I told them to do. Sorry, I don't live in Vladimir Putin's Russia. Uh, the Congress didn't do what he told them to do. And the, so it's much more malicious that not only do we have a kleptocracy coming under Trump, but its motivation is not business where we can say, okay, you guys are bad about this. This is about Trump and his power mongering and acquiring power in ways that hurt you. So is he going to resign? I mean, that's the question. I, I, I would put the odds of Donald Trump resigning the presidency is about the same as the sun not rising in the east tomorrow. Is he going to be forced to resign or impeached? Well, that's the obvious. Those are different fault. things. Yes, uh, I don't think you can force him to resign. Uh, Donald will only be impeached if one of two things happens. The first one is highly unlikely, and that is he does something so absolutely far out there. I mean, something like I don't know, he tears his clothes off and starts screaming, "The Martians are coming!" That the Republicans realize that they can't continue to make excuses for him. If the Democrats get control of Congress, they will move to impeach him. Well, they may not. I mean, the Democrats have not have a track record of, of paying attention to their knitting. The minority party, the Republicans, by the way, just so you know, I'm registered as a Republican and have been for years. The minority party has spent decades building bench strength, getting people elected to different offices and testing them out and moving them up, getting laws passed to suppress votes, to make sure votes aren't counted when they don't want them counted, to do all sorts of things to re reduce the franchise and enhance their power. Uh, gerrymandering, where what you try to do is create districts that are 53, 54, 55 percent your party, which means you can, with a lot of hard work, overcome that. Um, but, you know, there's no evidence that the Democrats are, are paying attention to their knitting. By the way, we're going to get their new financial report shortly, and I'm sure it's going to look like the last one. The Republicans are rolling in dough and the Democrats are starving. Well, what does that tell you about America? Think about this. So I, I would not assume for one second that the Democrats are going to take control of Congress. They may. They may have a wave election. They may get huge majorities, but they may not. Okay, so there's, we know what the Trump administration is doing, and I know that the media has been very good at, um, at following Donald's thumbs and, you know, the latest twitty uh, excrescence. But the question is, you talked about the FERC. You talked about Scott Pruitt. That's the first time I heard this story about Pruitt kind of sucking the information out of his staff and it kind of going somewhere where we don't know. Um, the first story... Because the Washington Press Corps, which is radically reduced, I don't want to beat up on them necessarily, and has been doing a very good job of covering the palace intrigues and this stuff, they're not covering the agencies. There has not been a mainstream reporter at FERC in decades. There's no mainstream reporter, to my knowledge, covering housing and urban development run by Dr. Ben Carson, who's, who, who oh, yeah. I kid you not, I kid you not, he has publicly said that the pyramids in Egypt aren't tombs for pharaohs. They were built to hold grain. <laughs> this is the kind of, you know, thoughtful, educated, competent people. As long as we, he doesn't say that we have to live in pyramids from now on, right? <laughs> uh, but, okay, yeah, so that was, the, that was the question about what the press isn't, isn't doing. We're not, we're not covering the government. We, journalists generally have never done a good job of covering government. Yeah. It's not considered to be a glamorous thing to do. You know, all sorts of people, I want to be the White House correspondent. I couldn't stand it if I had to be the White House correspondent. But it also means if you're going to cover these agencies, you have to know things. If you're going to do FERC, you have to know economics and physics and regulatory law. And very many reporters who know that stuff. If you're going to cover housing and urban development. You have a whole series of things you need to know. Most journalists do an excellent job of accurately quoting what's said to them and gathering material about what critics and people who disagree about that say. They write about what he said. This book and DC Report are about what they do. And it's interesting when you say that about reporters or repeaters. Um, we end up, I, I was at a, a journalism conference at Columbia uh, University, and I said, you know, 95%, 95% of all reports are simply repeated news, uh, news releases. 
and and you know, like you say, you have to know something, not just go gather the paper and go to the FERC's uh, PR department. Can, can, and, I, can I give yeah. an example of this? A lot of you may know that back in March, I got Donald Trump's 2005 tax return. I was return, just about just to the, ask. The first two pages, and which I think Donald sent to my house. But whatever, the White House authenticated the document. And the tax return shows that Donald paid $36 million and change in income taxes. Go look at the Washington Post, the New York Times, the LA Times, Bloomberg, everybody else. They will all tell you the president paid over $38 million in taxes because they counted his payroll tax for Medicare. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> all you had to do was look at the damn document and you could get the story right. The White House press corps took the word of the White House press secretary <laughs> over the document. And this is indicative of why we often don't understand things or know them because, as I said, even really, really good general interest and politics reporters, what do they tend to do? They report the official version of events and the unofficial version of events, uh, the, the official criticisms of the official version of events. Greg and I are in the business of the unofficial version of events. Yes, uh, it's called original reporting. And going to, it's very difficult. I mean, uh, people think, you know, you see these TV shows about investigative reporting. What was that, Murphy Brown, those shows? And, and they're all, all these reporters are waiting around for someone to show up with a document, right? Someone to show up with a document. Oh, they've got the hot thing, or oh, we're going to win a Pulitzer. That's not ha what happens. Most newsrooms, when a whistleblower shows up with documents, they say, oh, get rid of that guy. You know that. Uh, they don't want the documents. They don't want the information. They just want the latest tweet and counter tweet. And if it's, it, you know, um, if it's official agency stuff, that's it. The official word is final. And I don't care whether it's the New York is Vestia or Washington Pravda, you're going to get the same type of official or even official opposition. It's right. kind of an official opposition, too. You know, um, it, when I was doing, after all, my report in Florida in, uh, back in 2000, where I uncovered that Catherine Harris um, uh, removed uh, about 94,000 black people from the voter rolls before the election, calling them felons, exactly zero. And you'll see this in my film in cartoon form, so it won't be dull. I want people to stay awake. Okay, so it's a little Saturday exactly morning Exactly zero cartoon. out of 94,000 Exactly felons. zero, because I, I, yeah, exactly zero, because otherwise they would have been removed. So I, because I checked with the attorney general, because I said, how many of you are arresting? I said, if you found a felon registering to vote, who is not entitled to vote, and voting, what would you do? Oh, we'd arrest him. How many of you arrested? Um, well, we have six open cases. I said, you have a, um, 94,000 names from Catherine Harris. Oh, he says, yeah, I know about her list, but we have six open cases. I said, how many convictions? Um, I called a couple weeks, uh, about a couple months later, said, how many convictions? Oh, no, they're all bullshit. But um, so it was zero. Okay? I couldn't get the media in America to report that story until four years later when the New York Times wrote about the infinite, infamous felon purge of 2000. I said, that's interesting. They didn't report it in the first place. This is the first mention. Okay? And why? Because. I'll, I got to tell you one more story, sorry. Um, Dan Rather was going to report the story on CBS News. He said, oh, this is a hot story. He said, oh, by the way, the way I got it out, by the way, I had to go into exile. I reported for The Guardian. I was an investigative reporter for The Guardian of, of Britain and for BBC Television News out of Britain, out of London, where I lived. And um, the, uh, um, so Rather's people called me and said, oh, Dan really wants to do this story about, uh, is there anything else? I said, yeah, it was actually Jeb Bush's office which authorized, the, not only authorized, but um, uh, required the purge, like, uh, and imposed this on the counties. And I said, there's a letter. I was tipped off that there was a letter by a tipster. And I have the date of the letter. It was uh, September 18th, 2000. Uh, and uh, they said, um, I said, so, Okay, you know, I, I know you're a competitor, but it's important for America. Go get that letter, and you've got your proof of a really big story that Jeb was behind the whole thing. And the story didn't run, and it didn't run, and it didn't run, and it didn't run. Finally, I called a week later and said, what happened to the story? I mean, the count is on, by the way. We didn't have, Bush was not selected yet. This was vital for CBS to get out. And the answer was, because I said Jeb Bush had that letter, right? Wrote that letter. And the answer was, from Dan Rather's office, oh, well, we called the governor's office and they said it wasn't true. 
I said, I didn't even think of that. So I called the governor's office, got to a clerk, and said, the governor wrote this letter on September 18th. Um, and I know um, Catherine Harris, I was just speaking to her. She wants me to have a copy of that letter. Uh, she needs it. Uh, could you send it to me? And 10 minutes later, I got it in my fax machine. Wow. And it was not reported again on CBS. One of the Democrats going to stop playing nice. The Republicans are out for blood. And Democrats continue to play by the Marquess of Queens Bay well, rules. I don't know. I'm not a politics reporter, okay? I mean, I can describe to you what's going on, and that is I can tell you what the Republicans stand for on economics. They've been crystal clear about this. There is no beating around the bush. The Republicans believe that the reason the economy isn't even stronger and better is the rich don't have nearly enough. And that it's the duty of the Republican Party to get the rich more so they'll have enough to invest in things that will create jobs. And they have a way to get them that money. First of all, they give a tax cut, more than half of which goes to the top 1,000 families, one in 1,000 families in America. People who make over $2 million a year, but they persuade middle class workers, hey, you're getting $20 a week extra, and you're the real beneficiary here. And their fundamental other way of getting it is coming, but not till after the November 2018 elections. They're going to get the money by taking it from children, the disabled, the elderly, and the sick, people who can't fight back. Now, the Democrats, what is the economic policy of the Democrats, and how are they going to achieve it? Blank, fill in, I don't know. I mean, I, I have no idea. Well, I don't know, but we, we simply, we don't know what it is because they don't have leadership to articulate it. One of your great expertises is in taxes, and I'm very happy to get this question. Okay. Which is, okay, uh, how likely is it that corporations will close their overseas factories and move their manufacturing back to the U.S. Uh, just because they're statutory tax rate is now lower and they've got that money that they can that Apple can bring back um, well not to quote right. myself but about as same as whether the Sun will rise in the east tomorrow morning but there is a second element to this something you, you is contrary to everything you've heard in the news that we have at DC report you all heard Apple's paying 38 million billion dollars of taxes uh, Goldman Sachs is paying billions in taxes all these companies are paying billions in taxes Wrong. If those reporters had just read the bill, what they would know is that Apple will pay 8% of that $38 billion this year, and the rest of it over the next eight years. The last two years, they'll pay half of it, 25% and 25%. And that means that the Congress of the United States just loaned Apple at zero interest <laughs> the taxes it's not paying so they can invest that money and make more money and some companies some of them are going to invest that money in the federal treasuries that will be sold because we're financing the tax cuts with borrowed money which means you're going to be taxed to pay the interest to companies that are delaying paying their taxes into the future because they got zero interest loans Hmm? The tax bill. This is the new tax bill, the Trump tax bill. And it's at dcreport.org. You'll see a picture in the top carousel of Tim Cook. And there is a short, relatively short piece I wrote that explains it in plain English. And then Jim Henry, who writes for us, who in his 20s was the chief economist for McKenzie, the top business consultancy in the world. Uh, he uh, does this incredibly detailed analysis of what this means. But, you know, wouldn't you love it if, if the Trump administration would loan you your income taxes at zero interest and you could pay them back in a loan over eight years with most of it paid in 24 and 25? Okay, a, a question about Trump's attack on fake news. No. How does real news survive? Well, of course, I have another question. Is there real news? But go well, ahead. understand that Donald Trump had built his entire career on fake news. In the previous book, uh, I did The Making of Donald Trump, there's a chapter called Imaginary Lovers. Donald Trump got national news on his claim that Kim Basinger, 
Madonna and Carla Bruni, later the First Lady of France, were his lovers. Well, the first two had never met him, and the third one called him a lunatic. Years later, this is uh, back around 1990, years later, on Howard Stern's radio show, which of course uh, Donald was on all the time because it's the height of American culture and serious <laughs> politics, Howard Stern offered Donald the opportunity to walk it back. I mean, he guided him to how to walk it back. Did Donald Trump, you know, walk it back and say, oh, well, you know, I was just joshing? No, he doubled down. And Donald Trump, for years, planted fake stories in the New York Post. Uh, you remember the famous headline, best sex ever? Well, Marla Maples appeared on the TV show Designing Women. And if you go watch the episode where she's playing herself, at the very end, she looks into the camera and says, I never said that. <laughs> Which I think ranks right up there with the best line from Stormy Daniels. <laughs> Textbook was her best word. Textbook from the greatest Don Juan of all times. And Donald Trump has spent just decades planting stories with journalists, particularly at Rupert Murdoch's New York Post, who get rewarded for stories, doesn't matter whether they're true or not. And then news organizations follow up and they report these things. I mean, for starters, billionaire has mistress. Are you shocked or are you, do you think it's news? I mean, I would argue billionaire doesn't have mistress. Now that's a news story I want to read. And so <laughs> Donald, of course, creating fake news projects. And anything he doesn't like, he calls fake news. Uh, and and if, listen, if Donald calls it fake, you should, your initial assumption should be, oh, well, that must be not only true, but importantly true. <laughs> okay, I'll put you on the spot for a couple questions. You received Donald Trump's, at least the, the, the top okay. two pages of his 2005 taxes. Couple questions, which you can answer together. Who gave it to you? Oh, I think Donald mailed it. I mean, all likelihood. He leaked stuff about himself. Some people will be unhappy with what I'm about to say, okay? But last, in the summer of 2016, on July 31st and August 1st, the New York Post ran a whole bunch of photographs with strategically placed stars of a model, uh, Melania Trump. And these were not high art photos. <laughs> Uh, some of them were girl on girl with a uh, mattress with a sheet on it pressed against a plain wall and amateur lighting. Now, I don't know about you, but me, if, you know, it was my wife in that picture published, I'd first say, what the hell's going on here? And secondly, I'd call the New York Post and raise hell. What did the Trump administration do? Oh, no, we're, we're perfectly happy with the publication of these photos. What does that tell you? They either came from Donald or they were authorized by Donald. It's exactly what that means. Um, so Donald has a long history of leaking things about himself, posing as his own PR man, planning a story, and then calling up and, and backing it up by saying, yeah, no, no, what John Miller or John Barron told you, my PR guy, that's true. Uh, so I think Donald probably sent it to me. In all likelihood. Why? Well, that year showed an enormous amount of income, about $3 million a week. It showed he paid significant taxes when you include the alternative minimum tax, which he wants to get rid of. If it weren't for the alternative minimum tax, his tax rate would have been $5 million in round numbers on $153 million of income, which is less than 3.5%. And that's a very important number, I hope you remember. 3.5%, because that year, the poorest half of Americans who filed a tax return whose average income was $16,000, 300 bucks a week, paid more than 3.5%. So Donald Trump's policy is, on $3 million a week, I should be taxed more lightly than people who make $300 a week. Do you need to know more about his tax policy? Now, if it wasn't now, Trump... Now, just one more moment. Sure. What, what, he didn't give the 2006 return, or 7, or 8. The... AMT that he paid, it's not like the AMT I've paid for years that many of you have probably paid, which takes, took away your miscellaneous deductions. It didn't allow you a standard exemption or a personal deduction. It didn't allow you to deduct all sorts of things. Therefore, more of your income was subject to being taxed. 
His is the refundable AMT for real estate owners, and in all likelihood, the $31 million of AMT he paid, he got back the next year or over the next several years. Basically, instead of getting an interest-free loan from the government, he made an interest-free loan to the government. <laughs> Now, if someone was out to, if it wasn't Trump who gave you his taxes, in that case, um, whoever gave it to you and got his taxes and sent it to you broke the law and you helped them break no, the law. No, 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 not true. No, no, nope. absolutely not true. No. no. The law says that the IRS and people who are authorized in dealing with the IRS can't release the return. It, it, there are all sorts of people who could have proper possession of that return and turn it over. So that's not, that not at all necessarily true. That's one of the stories Donald and his cohort have been pushing. If you read the statutory section very carefully, not the way that a number of news organizations trimmed it, you will see that it applies to misconduct by government officials. So that, that means that everybody who's not part of the government can go ahead and get a hold of that? Well, it depends. If you signed a non-disclosure agreement and you gave out Donald's return, that's a whole other matter. I mean, my point is it's a much murkier sort of situation. But when a reporter receives, without having sought it, any kind of a document, you haven't committed a crime. You haven't done anything wrong. The courts have been very clear about that. Who knows what they'll be now that uh, we have the Supreme Court we do and the one that's likely to come if Ruth Gator Ginsburg can't keep doing her push-ups. Now, question uh, about that. If um, you authenticated that, the taxes. Well, the, the White, White House, House authenticated the, I mean, you, uh, the White House said, yeah. Right. That's the taxes. Okay. So Donald, you know, so was fake, he wrote about my thing and he said, fake news. And I tweeted back, gee, Donald, your White House authenticated the document. Fake White House news. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I bring this up is that um, so then there's another um, uh, journalistic service. Um, we had uh, Chelsea Manning, who was part of Barack Obama's whistleblower catch and release program. And... Um, <laughs> who released documents to a news service, WikiLeaks, um, did they do the right thing, WikiLeaks, by releasing the documents oh, as a journalist? I mean, um, this is not something I have uh, dealt much in, mm -hmm. but um, at the time that these documents came out, particularly showing um, uh, the murder of the Reuters reporters by the American military, yeah, I think that was a good thing to do, and I think we need to have a law that provides an exception for releasing classified material, uh, a la uh, the Pentagon Papers, where you are not trying to profit off it, you are trying to do a public service. And, and we know that uh, Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden tried internally to draw attention to things they thought were wrong, and Snowden says that he basically was told, keep talking about this and we'll prosecute you for something. Uh, that's a very disturbing sort of where are you going to go with your information. Okay, now, we have a, a question, emoluments, emoluments clause, a fancy ass words for lining your hey, pockets. How many of you have looked up that word in the dictionary? Good for you. Okay. About, about a third of the crowd Look up in the law book, too. said that. Well, that's even better. Yeah, we just got the mile. That's our, our attorney at the Palace Investigative Fund, Miles Muggle, not, who not actually to, looked up emoluments in the uh, uh Not to trump anybody, but I looked it up in an 18th century dictionary. Whoa. <laughs> so how you emolument someone? Well, you know, the, the Tell me about Trump, actually. Yeah, the founders the of this country were extraordinarily concerned as they started this radical experiment that we would have corruption from foreign governments, foreign businesses, and from local governments. I mean, many years ago I wrote about how the Gagibic Community College in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan made campaign donations, absolutely illegal, and the local paper defended them and attacked me. Um, and so the word emoluments appears in the Constitution three times. There are two clauses, a foreign emoluments clause and a domestic one. The domestic one applies specifically to the president. The president may receive no emoluments beyond his salary and perks from the United States or any of them, meaning the states. Well, good grief. Uh, the Secret Service is renting golf carts at full retail and rooms in his hotels and uh, buying meals at his golf courses. The state governments are doing the same thing. This clearly is a violation of the Emoluments Clause, but Congress is not doing its job. When Trump left 
the Capitol, after taking the oath of office to faithfully execute the laws, he had the beast, the presidential limousine, stop. And Donald gets out one side, and Melania, in that just stunning ice blue, cold ice blue dress, gets out the other side, and the whole family gets out, and they spend a two-minute turn on the street. The camera, the pool camera on a truck in front of the beast never moved. Not one of the TV networks told you, where did they stop? They stopped in front of the Trump International Hotel, Washington. The hotel whose lease says no federal employee may be a party to this. And of course, hey, got news, Donald. You are our employee. We're your bosses. And the signal was very clear, though, to any foreign government to any industry group, to any individual who wanted a favor. You want something from Donald Trump, you will pay tribute first. The Al-Sabah family, they are a very wealthy family in the Middle East. In fact, here's how rich they are. They own so much oil under the ground in their real estate that they call it a country named Kuwait. <laughs> they hold a party every year at the Four Seasons in Washington to celebrate their Independence Day and to thank America for ridding them of Saddam Hussein and sending in our soldiers to make sure that all the gold faucets were reinstalled in the Emir's palace before he came home to wash his hands. They moved their party to the Trump Hotel. If you go there, by the way, just have a lot of money in your pocket. Cocktails start at $36, steaks begin at $60, the Trump Organization had filed paperwork saying they expected the hotel to lose money for the first year it was opened. It's making profits hand over fist. And it doesn't even have a lot of rooms rented. They're making it from all the other business, which is a better way to make money, frankly. The, um, so Donald Trump is in violation of the Emoluments Clause all the time in everything that he is doing. And Congress isn't doing a thing about it. The checks and balances, well, it's not because they're Republicans, it's because they're Republicans who chose to do what they're doing. And there are a lot of Republicans in Congress who are appalled by this, but they aren't going to speak up because they don't want to be flaked. Mm -hmm. the, the, the questioner actually was um, very specific. He wanted to know if it was not just the, the domestic emoluments clause, but, but the also foreign. the foreign emoluments clause. Well, you know, Trump uh, said he set up this mechanism by which they would disgorge profits from foreign entities. Uh, as with all things Trump, things are not quite as they appear. <laughs> so it, it turns out, you know, basically two, uh, I, I happen to be the, f the founder of a little tiny, tiny hotel management company. And so it's a business I've studied and paid a lot of attention to because I had hopes of making it a big, big hotel management company. <laughs> and uh, Donald said, you know, wherever we can identify the profits that come from a foreign government renting our rooms, we'll disgorge the money. Then they decided they would divide between direct bill and credit card payment. And if you direct bill, then they don't know. And if you credit card payment, they do. And of course, that means if you're a foreign government, you just say, bill me directly. And then they don't have any profits to disgorge. It's, it's just, you know, another Donald Trump scam. It's interesting. I would know I was in um, Kazakhstan, and, and after uh, the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was there uh, and uh, pleasured the uh, dictatorship of, of uh, Nazarbayev, um, that immediately after Bill Clinton showed up uh, to offer a speech and was paid three hundred thousand dollars, does that violate the emoluments clause? No, because he's not president anymore. No, I'm foreign money. This is foreign. Yeah, money. but it doesn't matter. He's okay. not president anymore. Oh, okay. Uh, very good. There's I just no got law that prevents you from getting rich when you leave office. You know, Jimmy Carter didn't do it. Everybody else seems to do it. But the Secretary of State was. Uh, she wasn't Secretary of State when she took any money. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, I'll remember that. <laughs> they, did, they, they didn't either when she was. Okay. Very good. Uh, are the Republicans going to do interstate cross check in the midterms? And is anything being done about it? That's for those who followed me. My latest investigations for Rolling Stone, and then uh, before Al Jazeera. Um, is about this, this thing called interstate cross-check, the claim by Donald Trump that three million people voted twice. It would be a joke, except that uh, his henchman, a guy named Chris Kobach, created a list of three million people. I actually, and I'm the only reporter that asked for it. Of course, they turned you down, but I got it anyway. That's what I do as an investigative reporter. You see the hat. And I got, a, I got most of the list. And, you know, it, so they're saying people vote twice, people like James Brown. 
In fact, 538 guys named James Brown in in uh, Georgia apparently and voted it's such another a rare state. name. It's I mean, a rare name for a Republican. Um, <laughs> James Thomas Brown is supposed to be the same guy as James Edward Brown. James Brown Jr. is supposed to be the same guy as James Brown Sr., et cetera. You get the idea of one point of the three million voters on that list. And I've made a lot of it public, and it's in the film, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. Again, I think we've had one arrest of someone who accidentally, a Republican who accidentally registered uh, in two states at 90 years old, um, and he'd forgotten. Uh, <laughs> But I shouldn't be laughing. He's a criminal. Uh, but it justifies the whole program of removing all people named James Brown, Jose Garcia, etc. So are they using it 2018? Um, since I put some light on it, and we've had very little from our press, they've mentioned it, but never mentioning the racial, the vicious racial aspect of this. And um, it's uh, so two things. One. Um, I will say, because of the public pressure, instead of the massive explosion and expansion of this interstate cross-check new vicious Jim Crow program, which was like at 31 states, it's actually dropping to 26 states already. Um, Kentucky this week pulled out. Massachusetts just pulled out. Jesse Jackson today has joined with my Palace Investigative Fund to get Illinois out. And there was a 4-4 vote of their um, Board of Elections to uh, on party line. And so Reverend Jackson and I are preparing legal a legal attack on this uh, racist procedure. Um, we are going after Chris Kobach in his home state with the ACLU of Kansas. And uh, so they will be, will they be using it in 2008? Yeah, they're purging these lists as we speak. And I know the next question that goes with it, where are the Democrats? Beats me. Uh, so uh, at any rate, so that's uh, once again an issue about uh, press and action. So if you want to take on Interstate Cross Check or find out what it's about, get the movie. It's, it's released uh, by Amazon today on Prime, so the price is right. It's nothing. Um, don't worry, I still get 15 cents if you turn it on. I do, uh, and uh, or the, our our investigative fund does. So is Donald Trump, this card is coming for many people. I don't know if it's this one. Is ah, Donald, same is thing. Donald is Donald Trump a Russian agent? <laughs> well, it's a, we got about 11 yeah, questions. Yeah, I, I mean, this is the really the, the important question here that matters. Donald Trump has been getting money from Russians since 1983. A group of Russian gangsters ran a gambling operation on the entire floor of Trump Tower directly beneath Donald's three-floor apartment. Donald says, I had no idea. <laughs> um, uh, Donald's deal when he uh, sold the house about two miles from Mar-a-Lago in West Palm Beach, this unbelievably gaudy mansion built by people who make the 1950s Texas oil billionaires look like they were Renaissance painters. Um, <laughs> He buys it, and then the stock market collapses, and Donald sues Deutsche Bank, the preferred bank for Russian money laundering, uh, saying, I, I, I don't have to pay you $40 million I borrowed from you because the real estate market's totally dead, totally dead. Act of God, I'm excused from my loan. <laughs> but Dmitry Rebolovlov, who is one of the Russian oligarchs, uh, he comes along and buys this house not at the expected fire sale price, which should be left less than the $40 million or so Donald paid for it, but for $100 million, including a support, supposed $5 million commission. What's the cover story? He was hiding money from his wife. Well, I got to tell you, if I were trying to hide money from my wife, the last thing I would do is pay more than twice as what something is worth because that's throwing your money away. But Vladimir Putin's perspective on this would be quite different. This is an investment 
in getting a friend. And Putin thinks just like the venture capitalists. Thousand opportunities, you fund 100, 95 go broke, four of them get you back, the, the 95 lost, and then you hope you get the home run called Amazon. And, and that's what I believe was going on here. There have been numerous deals by Russians who've paid large prices for Trump properties, who have used anonymous wealth. When Trump Tower opened, there were only two first-class buildings in Manhattan where anonymous wealth could buy, uh, buy an apartment. You went to most co-op boards, you had to show your tax returns and your credit report and you know, allow them to look at your sock drawer. In the case, however, of Trump Tower, you could go in and say, well, I want to buy a $5 million apartment for cash, and I want to hold it in the name of Snow Inc. Aruba. Now, Snow Inc. might be a company that owns a ski lodge in Colorado, and it might also be a cocaine company. They don't ask, and they don't want to know. And so, clearly, there's been long, ongoing relationships. You know the Russians paid to bring Trump to Russia in 1987? There are much pictures of him there. Uh, he's been doing business with Russian-speaking mobsters for a long, long time. And Mueller's uh, investigation is surely going to show us uh, conspiracy taking place. And again, go look at the email on the internet that Rob Goldstone sent to Donald Trump Jr. in June of, of 2016 and get down to about the fourth paragraph where it says, as part of Russia's effort to help. Not only does that tell you they were already in business together, and so does Donald Trump's response. I love it. But they told six lies after this. One of them Donald Trump personally wrote out and dictated while he was on Air Force One coming back from Paris. They're trying to shut down the investigation. If there's nothing there, why do you care if it's shut down? They'll look like fools because there's nothing there. And finally, if you're running, and I think this is probably the most important element that tells you how bad they are, if you're running for an elected office in the US, it is a crime to accept anything of value from a foreign government. That doesn't have to mean money. It can mean dirt on your opponent. That's something of value. And there is only one thing any loyal American does if a foreign power, but especially the Kremlin, offers you help to become president of the United States. You pick up the phone, you call the FBI, and you say, hi, I need to speak to someone in counterintelligence. And they didn't do that. They didn't do that. So is Donald Trump a Russian agent? I don't know if he's witting or unwitting, but I know this. He is not a loyal American. And we are with David K. Johnson, the author of It's Even Worse Than You Think What the Trump Administration Is Doing to America. And by the way, you said that in the 2005, at least this is what I picked up from the book, in the, the 2005 Donald Trump uh, return you got, that there was an, you thought that there might be at least smoke of a fire of criminality in there. Is there something that suggests monkey business in that form? Well, Donald was tried civilly twice in, over his 19, 1984 income tax return by the state of New York and the city of New York. And there was clear evidence of fraud in that case because Jack Mitnick, his longtime tax lawyer and CPA, who was the only witness, was shown the only copy the city of New York or anyone else had of the tax return. It was a photocopy. And he, Say that again. Okay. It was a photocopy. Donald Trump's taxes, all they had is a photocopy. Right. The officially accepted Official. version was a photocopy. And Jack Mitnick was shown the document by Judge uh, Gregory Tillman, and he testified, that's my signature, but I didn't prepare that tax return. <laughs> that's about as good of evidence as, of, of fraud as you can imagine having. And nobody reported on this until it was in my book, uh, The Making of Donald Trump. Uh, Donald, in his tax return for 2005, took a $103 million write-off. Uh, that $103 million was apparently the last money from a $918 million write-off he took. And what was that write-off? Well, when Donald didn't pay his bankers almost a billion dollars, they of course deducted that as a loss to a bank. If you don't pay the loan back, that's a loss. They take a tax deduction. 
Donald bought a tax shelter, and he deducted it too. And that means it was deducted twice. Now, when the Republicans in Congress found out about this particular tax shelter, it took them literally just weeks to shut it down. I mean, this was so odious, boom, it was shut down. And, and uh, George W. Bush signed a law, no more of this. But as Congress tends to do with both parties and both presidents, those who already got their ill-got gains were allowed to keep them. They could have said, you know, no more. You can take whatever you got up till now, but no more. No, Donald got to keep it. Well, this is a tax shelter that if it's what I think he did, I suspect that there's more to it than just buying the illegal tax shelter. And here's the nice thing about that, about dealing with Trump. There's no statute of limitations on murder or criminal tax fraud. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> That's one of the things I wanted. And by the way, you're hearing, you're hearing, by the way, real investigative journalism. Okay? This is very difficult to do in the United States of America and get compensated for it or even get attention for it. I mean, we do, you will see our faces flash by on MSNBC or a few other places. If I may, I mean, yeah. here's the most important story about Donald Trump that no major news organization will touch, even right. though everything I am about to tell you, there is a public record, a court record, a letter written by Donald, official investigatory reports, okay? For most of the 1980s, Donald Trump was involved up to his eyeballs with a twice convicted mob associate who was a cocaine trafficker a major international cocaine trafficker. Donald Trump, when he opened his casino, his first one, needed helicopter service for the high rollers to fly him in and fly him back out with their wallets empty. And there were plenty of helicopter companies around the other casinos used. Who does Donald Trump go to? He goes to a company started by people financed largely with New York, I mean, New Jersey state tax credits who are connected to companies like one of the, what we could today call payday loan companies, their predecessors, and uh, pretty unsavory characters. And why does he pick these people? This is a very strange thing to do. Then Joseph Wechselbaum, the head of this business, after it's gone bankrupt twice and changed its name by moving its letters around, is arrested for running this drug operation from uh, the drugs come from Columbia to uh, Florida, where he has a car dealership called Bradford Motors, to Cincinnati, Ohio. And as a twice convicted felon, he confesses. He tells everything he did. He, so, there's a document of, of his allocution. He's unusual in that he actually handled the drugs. He took the drugs and put them in cars and then gave people gas money and said, drive. Donald Trump is told about what happens here. He's a casino owner. He could lose his license. And what does he do? He keeps doing business with the guy. This guy and his brother rent an apartment from Donald Trump in New York under very unusual circumstances. I assure you, you couldn't get the deal they got, and it's detailed in the book. <laughs> then, all of a sudden, without the prosecution or defense attorney being able to explain this, Joe Exelbaum's case in Cincinnati, Ohio, is transferred. Not to Florida or New York, as he asked, because he has homes there, but to New Jersey. And what federal judge does it come before? Marianne Trump Berry, Donald's sister. Now, Judge Berry, after three weeks, recuses herself from the case. She signs a document, and, but just imagine the conversation. You're the chief judge in New Jersey, a state, you know, that we all know is crystal, pure, clean. <laughs> and this federal judge comes into you as chief judge and, and, and a new, relatively new federal judge and says, you know, I, I've got to be recused from this case because, you see, my husband, you know, he's a lawyer for Donald's Casinos, and every week he flies back and forth to Atlantic City in this drug trafficker's helicopters. And, and sometimes this guy pilots the Ivana, Donald's personal helicopter, when I'm riding in it. And you're going, I have a sitting federal judge riding in a helicopter by a major international drug trafficker. Oh, my God. The newspapers find out about this. Seven years go by before Wayne Barrett, to whom my book is dedicated, susses this out and gets it out. 
Then the next curious thing that happens is Donald writes a letter pleading for mercy because Joe Wexelbaum is a stand-up guy. He is a, quote, credit to the community, end quote, and he shouldn't serve time. Now, the people who drove the drugs, they just drove the drugs. You know what they got? Up to 20 years. Joe Wexelbaum served 18 months. To get out early, he had to say he had a job and a place to live. So he tells his parole officer, I'm going back to work for Donald as his helicopter guy. And he says, I, I can't pay my federal fines. And I forget if it was 30000 or 50000 He wrote three $200 checks. But he said, I don't have any money to pay it. But I do have a place to live. He moves into a multi-million dollar Trump Tower apartment owned by his girlfriend with a mortgage for which there was no underwriting. Now, put all those things together, especially the letter, and when Donald Trump is asked about the letter by the New Jersey gaming regulators, he denies writing it. I didn't write a letter like that. I don't remember anything like that. Man with the world's greatest memory. <laughs> they then bring him the letter in a second visit, and he goes, well, that's my signature. There's nothing in the record indicating they asked the obvious next question. You could lose your license over this, Mr. Trump. Why would you write a letter like this, and why would you lie and deny about it? And the answer to all of that, based on my 50 years of doing this, is very simple. You would only do that if you were in business with the guy, and you were sending a signal that said, hey, no matter what happens, I won't rat you out. You're safe for me. And why would somebody like Joe Wexelbaum, who lives right near here, within a couple of miles of where we're sitting, why would Joe Wexelbaum be concerned? Because Donald Trump has a long history of when a grand jury or local police get on to something he's doing, that he runs to them and rats out the other participants. He did this in the sales tax fraud at Bulgaria in 1983, when Ed Koch, the mayor of New York, said Trump should have gone to jail for 15 days for sales tax cheating, which he it confessed to. So why is it that not one news organization has reported on this? There's documents. I went to my former newspaper, the New York Times. I told people that I know at the Washington Post. I told people at Politico. I told uh, PBS. I told people at the networks. I mean, I, everywhere I could, I wrote articles specifying this. And it wasn't reported. And here's just one, two things to think about in your mind. Take the exact same set of facts I just gave you and substitute the name Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama and ask yourself about what kind of coverage this story would have gotten from Fox News. Well, this is a, by the way, so what's very important here is that what wasn't covered by our press, and that's a real story yeah. in itself. He that, was, he, Donald was never scrubbed. Normally when you run for president, that's why we know about Whitewater, because the New York Times sent people down to look at Whitewater. Uh, Bill Rempel at the LA Times went and scrubbed the Clintons, did a thorough background. You can go into newspaper clips and find the names of Barack Obama's kindergarten friends in Indonesia, the boys he smoked grass with in Hawaii, and women he dated in college. But you won't find anything anywhere seriously looking into the background of Donald Trump. I complained to an editor of the New York Times that this story needed to be told in the fall of 16, weeks ahead of the election. And I was asked, well, when was this? And I said, most of the 80s. Oh, my goodness, that's so long ago. And I said, wait a minute. And I went to Barack Obama's childhood friends. It's just too old to really be of interest. Guess what that Sunday's New York Times front page main story was that went inside, I believe, for two, but maybe four clean pages with no ads? What Hillary Clinton was doing in Arkansas in the 1970s. I mean, this was just appalling what happened. It's a mistake. You know, it wasn't venal. Nobody got paid off. It was just Trump was so fascinating, everybody didn't look into him. Now he's in the White House. Why is this not now being looked at? The, the literal, and by the way, I'll tell you what I get when I go to some audiences. I will have people get up and say, well, Bill Clinton was probably involved in drug dealing too, and, and you know, Hillary Clinton is all, and, I'm, and they're like, I'm sorry. We spent hundreds of millions of dollars investigating the Clintons and never came up with a crime, a chargeable crime. 
but here we have actual records of an existing case. Why, aren't, why isn't this being asked about? And the list of criminal things Donald Trump has been, I mean, Donald Trump is a criminal. He's been a criminal his whole life. And most criminals are never arrested. When Rick Tulsky was at the LA Times, they did a huge project in which they, if I recall correctly, showed that of all the murders over like a 10-year period in LA County, in LA City, the whole, there are what, 78 cities in LA County the last time I looked, and the county, and only 28% of the murders were solved. And solve means the detectives on the case say, we know who did it, even if they don't have enough evidence to arrest that person. That's the standard that most murders weren't even being solved. And here we have this extensive record of what Joe Wechselbaum did and admitted to. Why has he not been brought before Congress? Statute of limitations on anything he did back then has run, unless it's tax fraud, and they can simply grant him immunity. What, why is, how can this not be a major story? And if what I think is likely that went on is true, that he was in that business, think about that. Think about what that means about our country. That should absolutely scare you. I think it goes beyond that Trump has a special pass. And by the way, just one quick thing. I should note that, that uh, David K. Johnson, who is with me tonight, this is Greg Palace speaking, is an, has been following the Trumpster for Four decades? It's 30 years come the end of May. 30 years. He has a book about the casino industry, uh, uh, that you're an expert in all these areas. So this is not, he didn't just discover Trump because uh, this is the new flavor as a marketing gimmick. This guy has been on the hunt. Yeah, Donald's been calling me at home since 1989 threatening to sue me. <laughs> well, but that's part of it too. I got to tell you that, that, that I, I want to bring up this, is that the, one of the reasons why Trump has been exempt is what I call the billionaire's exemption. It's not just Trump. How much information have you gotten behind the guys behind Trump? Paul the Vulture Singer. He's in my film. And now, finally, by the way, when, when uh, the, uh, the great uh, and recently late uh, reporter uh, Bob Perry was doing the Coke story, you know, and then I picked it up and went, uh, I was able to go further with it. And when I went back into journalism in 98, I got, in fact, in my film, I have, uh, there's a third brother, Billy, Yes. who on tape, he forgot. He wasn't always a sober gentleman that he is now. Um, and he's a, a right-wing crook. But he's, he did, uh, when he was um, relaxed, so to speak, he spoke to me on tape at length about the crimes of his brother. I put, again, on the coax, this information in The Guardian, no one would touch it in the USA. Okay. In fact, remember, it wasn't the papers that broke the stories about the coke that finally got attention. It was the New Yorker. Right. Okay. Well, it's actually surprising you got it in the Guardian because the libel laws are much tougher over oh, there. Oh well, the actually, I want to bring that up. The Guardian let me write about Paul the Vulture Singer and go go to Zambia, go to the Congo, as you'll see in the film, and find his victims. This is the guy that took cholera money, cholera medicine money from the Congo, money to clean the water supply. Okay. Paul, um, our president, Mr. Trump, at his first press conference, remember that co press conference where he had the kind of psychobabble meltdown? Well, it began with him saying, you know, Paul Singer was just left my office. First of all, this is the first president to, re to refer to the Oval Office as my office. Sorry, it's our office. Uh, but not one reporter asked what, when he said, Paul Singer's in my, basically waiting for me in my office, and he was so excited about it. No one said, what is the vulture doing in your office? Okay. Well, it's because Paul and, Singer is a hedge fund guy. He's not a politician. And my guess is most of the politics reporters, they didn't know who he was. Wouldn't they had no idea. And that's, that's one of the problems. They, they only know the puppet. They don't know the puppeteer. And, that, and the puppeteers have been ignored for too long. Uh, the billionaires behind guys like Donald Trump. And, that, you know, remember Donald Trump and, you know, I'm, I'm a finance guy. I went to Chicago, too, in finance uh, under Milton Friedman, God forbid. Um, and, <laughs> um, you know, from my analysis, in fact, looking at some of your numbers, too, um, is that Donald Trump just plays a billionaire on TV. I'm not sure he's a billionaire. There is not now and never has been a shred of evidence that Donald Trump has a billion dollars of net worth. Uh, two things. In 1990, when I broke the story that he wasn't a billionaire, Donald went around calling me a liar for four months until he had to put his banker's net worth statement into the paper. 
And the Philadelphia Inquirer ran my story on the front page above the masthead, which is the best play you can get. And the lead was approximately, you are probably worth more than Donald Trump. I mean, here's a guy who says he's worth $3 billion, $5 billion, he can't pay his bills. Can you imagine a billionaire who can't pay his bills? And Donald Trump, in the, the day he announced in 2015, said, I'm worth $8.7 billion. And a few days later, it was $10 billion, more than $10 billion. Once he even said $11 billion. <laughs> then he gets elected. And his lawyer, Sherry Dillon, or one of the people with her, says to the uh, Office of Government Ethics, uh, Mr. Trump would like to file his uh, financial disclosure statement, but not without signing it. <laughs> of course, you sign like your tax return under penalty of perjury. And the, Trump's office was told, no, you have to sign. So he filed it. And the news stories immediately were, Donald Trump has a net worth of $1.4 billion. Excuse me, if that number's true, if it's true, it's one-seventh of what he claimed to have. That should tell you right off what a fraud he is. But then if you look at the numbers, first of all, if you take all the 50 million and ups and double them, you don't get to $2 billion because that's the top category. But Donald puts a, a value of over $100 million on his golf course in Westchester County. But for property tax purposes, he argued it's worth $1.3 million. <laughs> Two houses that are not on the fairway sell for $1.3 million. He's got 100 acres, a 100-foot waterfall, an acre-size uh, clubhouse. He asserts that his Palos Verdes golf course is worth a quarter of a billion, 264 million I think is the number. It's more than a quarter of a billion dollars. I invite you to drive down there and look at it. Even with the price of housing, those of you who live in here LA, it, it's not possible it's worth that kind of money. And oh, by the way, for property tax purposes, $10 million. His, his, yeah. Yeah, his right. Scottish golf courses, he has to file British documents, even though it's a privately owned, on his revenue and his profits. They lose money, but he claims they're worth over $100 million. Money losing golf course. Boy, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't have any plans to buy a money losing golf course for $100 million. <laughs> it's all made up. Under oath, Donald has testified. How does he determine his net worth? Now, I know my net worth because I just had to sit down and figure it out. You know, you add up, well, I get this in retirement plans and some stocks and some art, and I own a house and another place. and. And uh, then there's not what I owe the banks, and that's the difference. It's my net worth. Donald? Well, it's, it depends on my emotions and how I'm feeling that day. And, he, and when, the, when he was asked about this under oath, he doubles down, and he goes on about it's about his emotions. He's delusional would be a reasonable interpretation of this. But or did ultra you, chutzpah. Yeah, but did you see news stories saying Trump revealed to be fraud? He doesn't have $10 billion. No. It wasn't even mentioned that he had made these claims while running and then filed documents that are totally to the contrary. Going back to that point that, that Trump is not a billionaire is very important, not just that he's a liar, okay, that he sold people on, his, on the great salesman that he is, the deal maker who can't seem to make a deal. But it means that he has to rely on real billionaires to to cover his campaign. Remember, he's going to self-finance the campaign. And, and remember this also, the targeted ads that the Russians paid for, somehow they knew exactly where to spend $125,000 to have enormous influence, which means they had help. Robert Mercer, the hedge fund billionaire's firm, Cambridge Analytics, was instrumental in this. And there is an interview with Robert Mercer in which he says proudly, the value of a human being is entirely based on their net worth. Most Americans are worthless. And my cats are worth more than most Americans because I get pleasure from them. I'm serious. I'm, this is him saying it. This is Donald Trump's, one of his most important supporters. And, you know. And, and a leader of uh, the Christian right, isn't he? Yes, and I mean, I don't know about that, but I mean, I, I can only uh, tell you that I assure you that the framers of our Constitution are spinning in their graves over this. I mean, you do have to understand that, that Mercer, whatever the, the few bucks in Facebook ads, we're talking about massive amounts of money. The, the, the Koch operations, Ameri Americans for, uh, 
prosperity. Uh, married for prosperity, their prosperity, and other groups uh, put up nearly $750 million, three quarters of a billion, okay, um, even though Trump himself officially spent less money than, than Clinton. And so I no, know from just billionaires. That from the billionaires that, you know, when it comes to the White House, the rent is too damn high. <laughs> well, I don't know. It seems like they're doing very, very well. The Cokes, the Cokes had priority number one was the XL pipeline, not because they own it, but be, they own the, the refineries at the end of the pipeline that get the oil. Okay, that's in the film. But the, um, the, the payback has been big for some of these guys. I mean, in fact, actually... Let's get a little wonky for a second, on because you are a tax expert, and um, among many other things. But um, Donald Trump made a big, big deal about closing a loophole that really only went for Wall Street billionaires, called carried interest. You, okay, you anticipated carried interest. Now I don't want even to go to sleep on this because see, it's these are the details that screw you to death. It's that actually you need to know about. It's actually very easy to explain. If you are a hedge fund manager you get a fee, typically 2%. So if somebody gives you a million dollars, you take a $20,000 fee right off the top. That pays for running the place. Now let's say you double the money. So now your client has $2 million. Well, you take 20% of that. If you're Paul Simon, you take 44%. Uh, but you take 20% of that, except right. it's not taxable income to you. You take shares of the partnership. And those are not taxable at the time the tax rate's 15%. That's the carried interest part, that you're paying this super low rate when it's really your work. It's your labor. It's your compensation that you should be charged the same rate that an executive for his services or, 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 a, or a successful telephone writer line or a movie man. star gets paid. Right. Those are higher rates for labor. So one is the 15%, but the real outrage isn't just the carried interest. It's that those shares aren't taxable until you cash them in. That means you just got... If you took 20%, $200,000 that's carried interest, you don't pay taxes on it. If Even if it's 15%, that would be, in, in that example, $30,000 of taxes you owe. And, it, and remember, we're usually talking billions of dollars here with all the clients. And that is an interest-free loan from the government. Remember, I brought this up a couple times before? If you ever pay it. Here's what's different. You know, you can't get your paycheck or pension check until the taxes come out of it because Congress doesn't trust you. But if you're a hedge fund billionaire or you're a casino owner or a real estate mogul or any other business, Congress trusts you to pay your taxes, and they trust you so much that often they'll loan you the taxes at zero interest for decades. So just that, just the part of carried interest that cuts, that that uh, cuts the tax rate, forty percent was, down was worth was worth to John Paulson, the foreclosure king. He that was worth two billion dollars to that guy, one guy, one billionaire who happens to be, and he never got covered. He was the head of Trump's. Um, so-called economic advisory committee, okay? And his partner in his big venture at One West was a guy named Steve Mnuchin. How did Steve Mnuchin become treasury secretary? You know, it was like if Mnuchin's story is he just kind of showed up, literally, he showed up one day at Trump Tower, and Trump said, oh, here's Steve Mnuchin. He'd make a great treasury secretary. That's a story, okay? Not Paulson's money, because Paulson was the first billionaire to step in with, by the way, Billy Coke, the third Coke, to come in. And when Singer came to apologize for being never Trump, what do you think he was saying in that Oval Office? Suddenly, Donald Trump, who had gone on the campaign trail and talked about this loophole called carried interest, he didn't explain it as, uh, as uh, David K. Johnson here would has done because he certainly didn't understand it. But, but he did know one thing. He wanted two things. One, he wanted to close it because he said it was so unfair, so unfair. That's a quote. And by the way, he, it's one of the few loopholes he doesn't get to use, okay? But here's the tax bill. Here's his chance to close this loophole, which is so unfair, so unfair. And he doesn't. And you have to go back to the fact that Trump is just plays a billionaire on TV. He isn't one as... David K. Johnson did a much better job than I will ever do in investigating that and proving it, that he might be worth less than your puppy, okay, or even Mercer's puppy. But, um, 
because he's the king of, of dead. He's in, that, he's in hock up to his keister. Okay, now, this is what's happening, and we need more attention to the guys behind the clown show. And that's why I'm very happy to have David K. Johnson here. Okay, even from our so-called best networks and, and media, they're not doing this type of investigative work. They're not digging in to the big issues and the money behind the clown show. Someone's paying for it. And in fact, when you talk about um, uh, the uh, issue of, uh, of carried interest, you know, the Mercers have been hit by, for like $7 billion, uh, uh, and Simon, Renaissance Technologies, for abusing, the loophole's horrible enough, but they have a massive uh, claim by the IRS. Potentially, and, and can, yeah, it's a potential. claim. It's and, a claim. And, and let's face it, under the, under the Trump IRS, you know what's gonna happen to that claim against his number one backer? And I hate to say it, his partner is Hillary's number one backer. Remember, these guys don't bet on horses when they, because they hold, they own the whole goddamn racetrack, right? So that's an important thing to remember, and that is the other side of the story. It's worse, and it's even worse than you think. But it's not like it was better. It's just that now it's the worse has gotten even worse. And I, I want to uh, again uh, thank David K. Johnston for joining us and giving us his time tonight. And, and listen, thank all of you for coming. Thank you for watching. And keep in mind, it's our government. We get to choose, but you got to register to vote. You got to turn out to vote, or it's somebody else's government. Thank you. So what do we do about this? Well, the most important thing that's going to happen in the history of America since the Civil War will occur in this country in November. If we keep the Congress we have, Donald Trump will do just fine. He may get a second term. Despite all the polls, he might get a second term. What have the Republicans told us? I mean, they're crystal clear about what's going on. They will destroy the FBI to protect Donald Trump. Now, I've written lots of things negative about the FBI and political spying, and I've exposed foreign agents and written about a lot of corrupt police activities. But at the end of the day, most of the people in the FBI are really trying hard to do a good job. Oh, no, 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 no. There's a cabal. You know, they're with Hillary. And yet the man in the White House is deeply involved with a foreign power. I mean, can you imagine when you were in high school, to those of you in the audience who are my age or older, if you went to high school in the 40s, 50s, or 60s, can you imagine if you'd had a high school civics teacher who said, the day is going to come when there'll be a Republican president who will praise the leader in the Kremlin, he will denounce the FBI, the CIA, and all the other American intelligence agencies, and the Republicans in Congress will take his side and back him up. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have gone to the principal's office and said, Mr. Jones needs to be seen by a psychiatrist. <laughs> but that's where we are. What matters is who turns out to vote in this next election. Gerrymandering, which is how the minority party, the Republican Party, and I'm a registered Republican of many, many years standing, manages to be in control is based on some simple math that you can overcome. You create districts that are 53, 54, if you have to, 55% your party, and then you take everybody you think isn't with you, and you corral them over here in districts that are 70, 80, and at least one case that I know of, almost 90% Democrats, or people you think will vote with the Democrats. Well, you can defeat a district that's 53 or 54 or 55%. You just turn out the vote. Scott Walker, governor of Wisconsin. Remember he had a recall a couple of years ago? He didn't get recalled. The polling data indicated he could have been recalled. You know why he didn't get recalled? Because the brilliant political strategist from the Democratic Party and the unions decided they were going to try and outspend the Koch brothers on TV ads. <laughs> Nothing you can spend, outspend the Koch brothers on. Had they instead gone to people and said, hey, Joe or Mary, I know you're out of work. We want you to come to the polls, 5 o'clock, election day, bring your car. We're going to put somebody else in the car with you. We're going to fill your gas tank. At the end of the day, we're going to give you a couple hundred bucks, 
and fill your gas tank again and we want you to drive people to the polls, they would have spent 10% as much money and they would have gotten him out. You got to get people to vote. Now, if you live in a district where it doesn't matter, either you like your congressperson and you think they're going to deal with Trump appropriately, or you live in a district where there's no possibility of replacing that congressperson, get in your car and drive to another congressional district. Call there, contact people there in advance, and work on that district and, and make change. Yet, if you can't go do it, get your Aunt Sally or your nephew Jack or your next door neighbor to go do it. But don't just gripe. You know, posting notes on the internet doesn't do anything. It may make you feel good, but it doesn't change anything. And we have the votes. And it's clear that there are plenty of Americans, more than enough, to change Congress. And why do you need to change Congress? Because the Republicans will never deal with Donald Trump. Now, Robert Mueller's report, when it comes out, I can tell you broadly what it's going to show for my 30 years of knowing Donald. He's a tax cheat. He was tried twice, civilly, for tax fraud. Totally lost the cases. Had no defensible conduct. One of the questions I've asked recently is, gee, did he have the audacity to take a deduction for paying off Stormy Daniels? <laughs> and Stormy Daniels and the Playboy Playmate, I assure you, are not the only ones out there. He's been doing money laundering for the Russians for years. He's done all sorts of things, deals with the Russians that make no economic sense. Donald Trump is not a loyal American. And if you doubt that, go home, look up the email that Rob Goldstone sent to Don Trump Jr. in June of 2016 and read the fourth paragraph as part of Russia's efforts to help. Now, that's not a, hey, we'd like to help you. Would you be interested, email? That's a, we're already in business together. We got a new investment opportunity, email. And this is an email that a month after it was sent, Don Jr. said didn't exist. Jake Tapper asked him about it on CNN. That when the New York Times sussed this out finally a year later and Don Jr. put it out, after that, the Trump White House and Don Jr. told six different stories, none of which can be true, all of which are incompatible with each other, one of which was dictated by the President of the United States on Air Force One coming back from Paris, and all of which show a conspiracy between Donald Trump and the Kremlin. And why people are not in the streets over this is astonishing to me. It's because Donald is masterful at saying, first of all, collusion. I don't care about collusion. First of all, collusion is not a crime. It's a conspiracy by a foreign power to put its guy in the White House in which he was a willing participant. Mueller's report's going to be really devastating. But without public hearings, the public isn't going to be ready for it. When Watergate happened, it was dismissed for a long time as... <laughs> and then we had Sam Irvin, a senator from North Carolina, nice old country lawyer Sam Irvin, who suddenly realized he was going to be in the history books, and by golly, his grandchildren are not going to read anything about him except that he was an American hero and patriot. And those hearings went on night, day, well, most of us watched them at night on PBS, but day after day after day after day, and bit by bit, people began to learn what was going on in the Nixon White House. And at the end of the day, the difference between Donald Trump and Richard Nixon is real simple. Richard Nixon's a patriot. He's a crook, and he's paranoid, and he made lots of bad decisions, and he deserved to be pushed out of office. But at the end of the day, he did the patriotic thing. He resigned as president. Donald Trump is pushed out of office. I'll tell you what he's going to do. He will travel the country for the rest of his life doing on a bigger scale what he did during the campaign. Beat that person up. I'll pay your legal bills. He's trying to get votes, and he says this. Now imagine he's out of office, what he'll say. He will foment violence and revolution. And I have written for almost 50 years now about people who literally believe, I've been to their conventions, that the government of the United States is a criminal organization, needs to be overthrown. There are books they write about it, there are meetings they have, there are fringe groups, but boy, Donald will he'll be right in there with them. You have the power to do something. 
The first thing you have to do is get informed, which is part of the reason I want you to read my book, so that you know what they're doing. Not just what he's tweeting, not just his crazy racist statements, not just his flip-flops because he has no principles of any kind except the adoration and the glorification of the world's smartest, greatest memory, Donald Trump. You know, a man who says that he can learn everything you need to know about nuclear missiles in 90 minutes, and who also says he's one of the world's leading experts on a subject on which I am recognized around the world as an expert, tax policy. A subject in which he says, I know nothing of accounting. Well, if you don't know anything of accounting, that's like saying, I'm the world's greatest pilot, but I don't know what a wing is. <laughs> they just don't go together. But people have to build a case. You can't just say, I don't like the guy. You've got to also have a positive case. What am I going to do? We get rid of Donald Trump. Why are we going to do that? Why are we going to have somebody else? We're going to have somebody else because, hey, you know what? We want back the Clean Air and Water Act that Richard Nixon signed into law because a lot fewer of us have died from cancer and asthma and heart disease. We want to have a society in which we're not going to bed worried that we're going to get into a nuclear war. We don't want a president who goes around saying, of course we're going to use nukes, as he did. Because we want to have a Department of Housing and Urban Development run by somebody who actually knows something about housing and urban development. We want to have an FBI that isn't demoralized and where people aren't punished for doing the right thing. And you have the power to do that. You have the power to do that. That means you have to get organized. You need to raise the awareness of other people. You've got to patiently listen to people who don't agree with you. And respect the fact that a lot of people have been sold the con. They really think that Donald Trump is a demigod, not Gog, God. That he is their savior. There are many people, like a woman who sent me an email from Indiana who said, Mr. Johnston, I've been watching you on TV and I don't understand now that we have a fine Christian family man in the White House. <laughs> Your head reels at that, except if you only read Breitbart or watched Fox News, you'd believe that. You would believe that. If you watch, look at Breitbart and Fox News, you know, I'm probably the leader of the Sharia-loving, let's overthrow the government Muslim crowd. And the Democrats, you know, they just want to take all your money for themselves. You need to persuade people. But where you can't persuade people, that's okay, you're not going to persuade everybody. On the day Richard Nixon resigned, 29% of Americans supported him. 29%. Not one member of Congress in either party, but 29% of Americans. And, and that's not surprising if you know a little bit about demographics of America. Fox News for years did very, very good polling. Roger Ailes may have been a lot of things, but he was really understood he needed good polling. So year after year after year, Fox News did a poll about religiosity. About 42 to 44 percent of Americans believe there's an angel following them around. About 27, 8, 9 percent year after year believe in witches but in what I think is a pretty good measure of sexism, only about 22 or 3 percent believe in warlocks. <laughs> well, there's going to be a crowd of people who will always be with Donald. People who, they don't want to sit next to a Latino in the airplane, they don't want an Asian in the cockpit, and God forbid they don't want to have to report to a black woman boss. They hate the civil rights movement. There has been a movement in this country for a long, long time to repeal the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. We've had members of Congress speak in favor of this. Gets almost no news coverage, but it's out there. You're not going to change those people. Get the people who are changeable. Persuade them. Get them to register to vote. Get them to the polls. Elect a different Congress. And when we get a different Congress, we'll get somewhere. And there's one more crucial element to this. Pay attention to who's running. I was sent a video the other day that, uh, it's sort of like Instagram, you know, I could watch it and then I couldn't watch it again. And it was a couple of young people, good looking, earnest, clean cut, they're going to run for Congress as Democrats against Donald Trump. And then local TV reporters asked them some questions. And it was immediately clear they knew nothing about the government. 
They didn't understand the House from the Senate. They didn't understand the Constitution. I mean, these people were just eviscerated as idiots. And they didn't have Donald Trump's skill to buffalo their way out of the questions. You can't run incompetent people if you want to change the Congress. You've got to get people who know what to do and get them to do it. It's our government. We own it. We need to act like owners. And if we don't, well, tough luck. We will slide into becoming a fascist state over time because there are people, I assure you, I don't know who they are, but knowing what I know of human nature and over 50 years of reporting, there are people who are looking at Donald and saying, boy, if you could get a candidate who didn't have Donald's deficits, somebody who's actually smart, actually educated, Someone who doesn't speak in word salad. It's beautiful, it's beautiful, it's terrific, it's just, it's gorgeous, it's terrific. But can speak in coherent ways. And who is organized and can appoint people. You can take over this country. You could turn us into a fascist state. It wouldn't be that hard. We're at a real deciding point in this country about what we want in our future. Now, we can endure Donald Trump. What we need is to have such decisive action that it pushes back so strongly, it is such a powerful political force, that we don't have to worry for at least another generation or two about people like Donald Trump coming into office and doing something. So please don't leave here feeling depressed. There's plenty to be depressed about, plenty to be down about, but energized by the thought that, yeah, we can do something, and I'm going to do it. I want us to have a new Congress. I don't expect I'm going to like everything our new Congress does. I don't expect it to be perfect. Look at the progress we've made in this country. This was a country that started off with the great compromise that you could own human beings. We got rid of that. It costs us the equivalent uh, in today's population of six million of us dying, of whom, by the way, about 15% were black Americans. But we got rid of that. Women got the right to vote because men voted it for them. The only people who could were men. The advocates in the late, 18th, late 19th century for child labor laws were denounced by the Jerry Falwell Juniors and the uh, other, uh, you know, today's TV preacher types who said, it is God's plan that these children work in the factories and those who, are opposed, who propose these child labor laws are the agents of the devil. We got child labor laws. We got laws that allowed the organizing of workers for unions. And what does Pope Francis say about that? There's no economic justice without unions. Because workers cannot, with the exception of people who are name brand talent, negotiate for their pay. At the end of the day, if you're a secretary, a doctor, a lawyer, a police officer, a firefighter, a biologist, you're a commodity. Other people can do something, unless there's something unique and unusual. It's a very tiny segment, small segment of the population that's like that. If you don't have a union, you're never going to get paid what you should. We had union laws, and then we let them fritter away. We have these environmental laws that are still on the books. We need to go back and enforce them. We need to be building a better America in the future, not a worse one. So... Figure out what are you going to do and do it. Resolve and actually do it. And if you don't do it, don't complain. It's as simple as that. Just don't complain. So I, I want to thank people for coming tonight and I want to take a lot, of, a lot of questions. I'm going to have one rule when you come up to ask a question. If you can't ask a cogent question, I'm going to cut you off let you figure out how to edit your question while I talk to the next person, and then we'll come back to you. I'm not going to stop you, but I, let's ask questions, all right? Do you have a question? I Just do. turn the mic. I do. There we go. You and I and everyone knows the media is diverse, and yet it's lambasted, and it's a source of doing a lot of the work you mentioned, how do you think we can rehabilitate the image 
too many unthinking people have of the media so that they yeah. go to it in a thoughtful okay. manner? Well, there has been a more than 40-year, very well-financed, sustained campaign from the right in this country to denigrate honest journalism. I've been the subject of a lot of it. I've tangled with these people a lot. And my answer to it is, you know, you, you have verifiable facts that you can prove with the case. Now that more of that is being picked up as a lesson, of course, the answer is, well, there are no facts. There are alternative facts. Um, um, fundamentally, though, news organizations are going to do what news organizations do, especially in this era of much reduced budgets. They're going to tend to cover the sizzle more than the steak. New York Times does a great job of trying to get at the stake, but even so, they do more sizzle than anybody else. They're going to cover the controversy a lot more than the underlying issue. And even at the Wall Street Journal, lots of reporters write stories that I read every day where I go, boy, that's a really interesting story to read, and it makes coherent sense, except the economics are nonsense because the writer doesn't know economics. And we're just not going to be able to fundamentally, I think, change that. But, you know, when we started this country... We had party press, and they just made up stories. I spent a lot of time studying the early days of our republic and the red, literally read reproductions of newspapers from back then. And it's amazing. I mean, they just make, you know, Governor so-and-so is having an affair with this, this woman, and there's no such woman. <laughs> it's not like they got it wrong. They just made it up. And we survived that, okay? Um, I do think we need to have a full frontal assault, though, on the President of the United States going around saying fake news. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't, you know, I'm in the diagnosis business generally, not the solutions business. So tonight's talk was solutions, but, sir. What are your suggestions, or what is your solution? To? For political tribalism. How do we learn to talk to one another? Well, political tri does people know what political tribalism means? It's this notion that we've broken down into groups where there's the other and there's us, and we don't talk to the others, and we don't listen to the others. That's part of the reason I told the story about walking into blue-collar bars, which, by the way, I didn't do recently. This was years ago. Um, and there, you know, when there are big social changes, you have to let them run out. Part of the reason Donald Trump is in office is the same reason the Taliban are on the rise and we see uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews with some of the things they're promoting in Israel and we see ultra-Orthodox Muslims with some of their policies like the, the Taliban. And it's that there's a segment of the world population that just cannot cope with the incredibly rapid rate of change. Human knowledge since World War II has been growing I wouldn't be shocked to find out it, it would be correct to say logarithmatically, but it's absolutely been going, growing geometrically. And if I'm correct about this, that there are a segment of people who they want their white picket fence and they want minorities to know their place and they want women to, you know, keep their mouths shut and, bring, bring, and fix dinner, you can put your hand up, but the tsunami's just going to run over you. It's a social tsunami and it's got to run its energy out. So if you're a journalist, the only thing you can do is make a record. Tell everybody what's going on because eventually they will recognize it because the energy will run out. And the other is, be nice to other people. Talk to other people. Listen to other people. Be nice to other people. Change the nature of the intercommunications you have on a personal level with people. Don't cut people off in traffic. I mean, a little thing like that. I live in Rochester, New York, where people do not cut you off in traffic. They'll stop and they'll let you turn. I mean, there have been studies done about this. Why is Rochester like this? Because we have a culture that that's what we're going to do. And, you know, we stop for people. And if you, you drop your, your umbrella on the windy street, there are people who will chase after it and get it for you. It's just a cultural phenomenon we've created there you can have everywhere. You don't have to have traffic like L.A. does where everybody cuts everybody off. So some interaction. But listen to people and respect that people don't have to agree with you. People don't have to agree with you. We need to agree on what the basic facts are. We don't have to agree with the interpretation of the facts. So beyond that, I don't know. I'm not a sociologist. Uh, yeah, my question is about uh, Pence. Um, we kind of have a picture of what the con man 
Agent Orange is like now, but Michael could, Pence. Could you comment on Michael Pence yeah. and if he should have a chance at the office with that? You, you've actually addressed what I think is potentially going to be an enormous constitutional crisis and could lead to violence in this country. Um, the, the, there is, I don't want to be on a downer now, but there is no good ending to Trump's leaving office. We will endure this, we will get past this, but his leaving office, there's no good ending. Assume he serves two terms, it's still not going to be a good ending because when he leaves, he's going to claim he was cheated somehow and the, the, we should repeal the, what is it, the 22nd Amendment that uh, says two terms. Um, if, he's not going to be removed under the 25th Amendment. That only works when the president has either, as with Ronald Reagan, was shot, and God forbid I don't want that to happen to Donald Trump, um, and, and he's out of commission, he's under anesthesia, it works voluntarily, it doesn't work to remove somebody. It's just not going to happen. So assume that the Democrats get control of Congress, and they decide to remove Donald Trump, and they make a case and persuade the American public that this is the Russians' candidate, and the man is disloyal, and he's a criminal. It won't be hard to prove he's a criminal. Can Mike Pence become president? Because he is also the beneficiary of the Russians interfering in our election. And Mike Pence has been credibly reported to have gone around telling his friends, you know, that God put him here. And God has a purpose and a plan. He doesn't know what it is, but that's why he's there. This guy's a small town radio talk show host who should go back to being a small town radio talk show host. But if the Congress were to remove, under the Democrats, both men, and I think they have to do that if they're going to use the Russians. Then the Speaker of the House becomes president, which means most likely Nancy Pelosi. And I can see people already screaming bloody murder on Fox News. This is a coup d'etat. So if that happens, I believe that Nancy or whoever is the Speaker has to say, I'm a caretaker president. I will not be involved in the election in any way. I'm just going to put my hand on the tiller to keep us moving forward until the next election. We can endure that. We're not going to have any trouble with that. But you've got to be Caesar's wife. So what happens if the Republicans retain control and the Republicans run a candidate like Mitt Romney in the primaries and they primary Donald and he loses? Well, we know what he's going to say. I really won. It was rigged. They rigged it. It was really, I won. The Republican establishment did this. They rigged it. It's all corrupt. And now you have to worry about, is he going to try somehow to do something extrajudicial? Luckily, the latest surveys show the officer corps of the military does not support Trump. You know, soldiers are willing to go and die, but they're not going to die for stupid reasons. <laughs> One of the great lessons we finally got in the American psyche because of Vietnam is, you know, you're going to go die, die for a good reason. Um, and let's assume that he wins the nomination again. And then he loses both the popular vote and the Electoral College. It'll be the same thing. It was all rigged. I really won. It was all those illegals who voted. And the, 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 there's just no good ending to this. But I do think that if they're going to remove Trump on the basis of the Russians, you really do have to talk about can Pence serve. And if they say we're not going to deal with that, we're going to let him serve, um, just think about four years with Mike Pence as president, especially if you're a woman. Especially if you're a woman. And remember this, there are a lot of women who think he should be president because they agree with his, what I would regard as absolutely outrageous misogynist views. But there are a lot of women who support that. So. Sir. Um, with the recent special election in Alabama and, and Doug Jones beating Roy Moore, do you think that portends good things for this November, or was that an aberration, you know, with uh, the, Doug, Doug, uh, yeah. the uh, Roy Moore situation? I'm a policy person. I'm not a politics person, okay? But it seems to me there are a couple of lessons from Alabama. One of them is, what a horrible bad candidate they ran. <laughs> it turns out lots of people in Alabama, you know, they paid attention to know about Roy Moore, and um, I suspect that... A, a question arose, and I say this having talked to a few people who are friends of mine who've lived in Alabama, about Roy Moore's behavior that's a little contraindicated. And that is um, just, you know, 32-year-old man gets these 14, 15, 16-year-old girls half naked and liquored up and doesn't try to have sex with them. 
That suggests there's something else very deep going on in that man's psyche that would be death to you as a conservative Republican in Alabama. And um, it, they ran a horrible, terrible candidate. And when Richard Shelby, the senior senator from Alabama, said, I'm not voting for him, what happened? He came under attack. You know, um, if you run a really bad candidate, guess what? You're, uh, you're going to lose. But there are lots of people who are sort of little bad, half bad, you know. Look what happened to Senator Johnston from Utah versus when Mike Lee ran against him from the right, you know. Principal guy, Senator Johnston, no relation. Um, and Mike Lee, very unprincipled guy. So I, I, I don't know. It matters a lot who the candidates are that you run. Right now, the Democratic National Committee, if you look at their finance reports, having trouble raising money compared to the Republicans. Money's rolling into the Republicans and not to the Democrats. I get these emails every day from Nancy Pelosi, well, not from them, but ostensibly from them, James Carville and others. We need $1 to defeat Donald Trump. Come on, are you serious? These are, these are a joke, and they suggest the, the Democrats still don't have their act together. They haven't for a long time. There's somebody over here? No. I guess we're going to go from my perspective to the right of the room more. <laughs> so I've been very... Now, from my perspective. I've been very mystified why the Republicans are not rising up against Trump. Um, and speculating... Well, that's easy. The, the reason they're not, rise, they're not rising up against Trump is look what happened to Jeff Flake. Who is the most powerful, the, not powerful, the most prominent, important family in Arizona? The people who settled Arizona. It's the Flakes. They got a town name after him, Snowflake. And he can't run. So that's, I'm, I'm not, some, George, Jeff uh, Corker, he can't run. They will, in a primary, destroy him. And they'll run the dirtiest campaign in the world. So I, don't be surprised, Donald Trump has essentially a mafia enforcement gang in the Republican Party led by Robert Mercer, the, the hedge fund billionaire who says, literally, in the tape, in the tape recorded interview, um, the entire worth of human beings is based on their financial net worth most Americans are worth nothing, and my cats are more valuable than most Americans because they give me pleasure and that enables me to make more money that makes me a more important and valuable human being. So anyway, all right, now go on. Well, <laughs> I've speculated that, it's, that McConnell and Ryan, uh, that they have a grand plan, let Trump and Pence go down, and then Ryan can be president. And what do you think of that? And then also, what do you think of McCabe retiring today? Well, he's retiring because he's not going to be with us much longer. But um, um, I, I, uh, um, yeah, as somebody who's actually broken up conspiracies, I'm not big on conspiracies. And I, that's not what I see Ryan and, and McConnell doing. Uh, uh, McConnell is a very, very uh, competent legislative practitioner in the Senate. And he gets what he wants, and he knows what he wants, and he plays his cards very, very brilliantly. And he wants out of Donald Trump certain things. He wants this tax bill they just got. And he got it. And by the way, how many of you think Apple and a bunch of other companies just paid billions of dollars in taxes? You read that, didn't you, in the newspapers, heard it on TV? Go to dcreport.org, and you will find out they didn't pay it. This was a con game. They will pay it in the future. But you really should go, go to dcreport.org and, and read our story that ran yesterday, the Apple tax scam, because I promise you, it is, we just read the bill, and they didn't pay the money. Um, so I, I, don't, I, I don't think sort of that's their game. I think they figure we can use this guy. They haven't been real successful at it. I mean, they control the White House, the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court, arguably, and they haven't done much compared to what you would expect. Sir. Uh, should oh, wait a minute. There's somebody over here, and I'll come back to you. Go Fair ahead. enough? Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, so I, I had it resonated with the political termites uh, point you made earlier, and uh, one of the things I've seen as well, being from the center of the country, is there is a sort of divide between the bigger cities that are really getting a lot of benefit in our modern era. So how, what policy or what recommendations would you help say would help empower those sort of middle states, middle yeah. areas? Well, the world changes, okay? If you were born in uh, Dickens, England, 
you know, life was very different than if your, your grandfather or your grandmother had. And we're in the middle of an enormous fundamental change in the world that we don't understand. We can't understand it because we're in the middle of it. But what we're seeing is large numbers of people being left behind economically. Angus Deaton, the Nobel Prize winning economist, just had a piece in the New York Times about the millions of Americans who live on a dollar or two dollars a day. I wrote that story for the New York Times from my analysis of the data about 10 years ago, and I wanted to be very cautious so I couldn't be attacked. And the number I settled on after looking at the various ways to do the numbers was $7 a day. And, oh, you know, this is obviously untrue. I should be fired. This is incompetent. Deaton's closer to what's right. I actually wanted to use a number of about $3 from the analysis I did. And we haven't figured out what to do about this. What do we do about people who... We're living in a world where the amount of brain power you have and then your willingness to work with that brain power is going to have a huge determination on your income. Industrial society created jobs through inefficiency. When the first steel was made 2000, more than 2,000 years ago in India, where they invented it, guys with big muscles would take coal, carbon, carbon from coal and wood and pound it into red hot steel and it would take more than it would take multiple years of labor to create one ton of steel. In vanquished societies in the ancient world, the tribute that was paid to the conqueror was often not paid in gold or diamonds, it was paid in steel. If you watch Game of Thrones, what is the common thread that goes everywhere? Oh, that's a sword made of valerian steel. It's the big thing running all through, one of the big things all the way through it. And we're now living in a world where, you know, if you weren't born with a lot of smarts, the future doesn't look so good for you. And because inefficiency creates lots of jobs, as we become efficient, they're going to go away. And we have, we're not even talking about what do we do about that. There are proposed solutions. The Capitalist Manifesto of the 1950s had a solution. Everybody should be a capitalist. The problem with that, lots of people, when they get capital, they don't think long term. They don't think about, oh, I've got a million dollars and I can spend $25,000 a year forever. They think, oh, I can buy a sports car and a boat and go gamble. And, and so, you know, human development, we're going to go through a real problem here. And it isn't one state or another. It's the fundamental world economy of what's going on. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big problem, but I don't, I don't know the solution of it. I've thought a lot about the problems it's going to bring. And it may lead to a lot of violence. If we don't take care of people one way or another, it's going to lead to a lot of violence. There have been, by the way, a number of very interesting experiments around the world done with a basic income. Everybody gets an income. And the assumption you might have is, well, then people just sit around and drink beer and have sex and not do anything. No, actually, it turns out most people, if you give them a basic income, use that to improve their status. They may not work real hard. They might decide to work a little less hard. But they figure out how to use that income to get an education or start a little business or do something that will improve their lives a little bit. So thank you for your patience. You bet. Uh, related question. Question part A. Um, Lindsey Graham said if Trump fired Mueller, there would be hell to pay. So the question At is... At one day he said do that. You, do you, yeah. yeah. Do you believe that would happen? Part B is if Mueller's report shows an impeachable offense... Would the House impeach him, the Republican House, impeach him, and would the Senate convict him? Okay. There's no chance the Republicans are going to impeach Donald Trump barring something really out there. Okay? I mean, what I expect to see in the Mueller report, the Republicans are not going to move on. They're going to explain and excuse it away and everything else. And Lindsey Graham has proven to be as slippery on the issue of Mueller's position as, as you can possibly imagine. First of all, Trump can't fire Mueller. Even though I watched, um, um, sorry, old age, the, um, the independent prosecutor went after Bill Clinton and was later at Star, Ken Starr, on Fox News today, saying, of course he can fire him, and he should fire him, and he went on and on. It's not true. We have rules and regulations about this. He has to get Rod Rosenstein to fire him. Rod Rosenstein will clearly resign. There's another person, a woman, who's next in line. But go for, down. If you're willing to fire enough people, he'll get to somebody who will fire Mueller for him if he wants. Well, when Archibald Cox got fired, the people just all came to work. Now, 
If Trump's going to do it, the question is, is he going to try and shut this down? And here's the flaw in the idea of doing that. Mueller's people were very smart to tell Eric Schneiderman, the Attorney General of New York, that it was okay to let the public know that he was working with Mueller's team because many of the crimes Donald Trump has committed are state crimes in New York as well. So pardons won't help him and other things won't help him. And I'm sure that uh, Schneiderman has lots of the records through a sharing arrangement. And they've, they've got the documents right now, if we had the bait stamps on them, which is how lawyers track things, I assure you that number is well past a million and probably millions of pages of documents, witnesses and people you've never heard of. And so um, I don't think the Republicans would act on the firing of Mueller. Some of them would be quibbling one up, but I don't see Ryan and, and McConnell moving to replace Trump, barring something really outrageous. I mean, if we could come up with a direct videotape where Donald Trump says, Vladimir, I pledge I'm going to turn over America to you. And of course, Donald would say, that's not my voice. <laughs> but why, why wouldn't they? What happened to Because why wouldn't, why wouldn't the Republicans do it? Yeah. What happened to states? Well, but that's, we, we, we got rid of that. Um, uh, and, and we got rid of it through uh, Dick Armey. The congressman from Texas, you're really going to be the last guy. Dick Armey, the congressman from Texas, who said, and then it was popularized by Grover Norquist, bipartisanship is date rape. Political date rape. And it used to be that, you know, members of Congress, when they took the train to go to Washington and they were there for months at a time, Democrats and Republicans lived together like cats and dogs. And they drank together, they smoked, they played cards, they did other things men away from home for long periods of time have been known to do. And they knew about each other. That's all gone. There is not a single Democrat living in the same house as a Republican today. Not one. If they share a taxi cab, they think that's bipartisanship. And especially in the house. And we need to stop that. We need to get that back. We need to have people conversing and recognizing that compromise is what democracy is. This my way or the highway, that's got to go. And we can't do that with the Congress we have because it's full of people, especially the Freedom Caucus people, who are my way or the highway. You know, if you're an absolutist about abortion right down to the point where any birth control is, is, uh, it should be illegal, you got to get that person voted out of office or you're going to continue to have that argument. You get the, as uh, Lawrence O'Donnell says, the last word. I'll or at least the last question. I'll take it. As a Republican, what kind of tax policy... You're asking me? I'm a registered Republican. That's well, not that's a Republican. that's what you said. <laughs> oh, what, what does that mean, then? It means I vote in the Republican primaries. Okay. You get to vote in the Republican primaries. Okay. Where I live, those are the more interesting primaries. All right. I was... I, was, I mean, and by voting in them, you know, it means like you can... I, I got the chance to vote for a man who believes dinosaurs and human beings live together and that the cure of diabetes is cinnamon buns. I mean, how, when do you get opportunities like this? Okay, then, then, then I'll ask my second okay. question then, yeah. so it's not relevant. Do you see the states' rights movement rising in America? What do you mm. think about that? Boy, this is one of the great paradoxes, right? States' rights movements have been a way to put Jim Crow in, to deny the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments and undo the Civil War. And where is it that states' rights have proven to be most important in recent years is with liberals and progressives. If, if the Democrats during the Al Gore vote re and, and George Bush vote recount had had the courage to say to the Supreme Court, under our Constitution, gentlemen, and you particularly, Justice Scalia, as someone who talks about the original intent, have no business in this matter. This is entirely for the electors of Florida. George Bush probably wouldn't have become president. And yet, no, they were good liberals. They couldn't bring themselves to do this. Um, I, th I think we're going to have a lot more discussion in this country about federalism, about separate state laws. You're seeing uh, California basically saying, you don't want to enforce the federal environmental laws? Fine, we got state laws. And now we're going to have a fight over the supremacy clause of the Constitution. I mean, one of the best things you can do is go home and read the Constitution. It's only 4,000 words for the basic Constitution and 3,000 for the amendments. You'll find stuff I'll bet you didn't know was in there. Letters of Mark, blood libel, all sorts of interesting things. So um, I want to leave you with the most important message here. Please do read my book, okay? <laughs> because 
my book is about what matters to you and to your children and to your grandchildren and to the rest of the world. You want to read Michael Wolff's book, which, by the way, verifies my previous book about Donald Trump? Please do. It's entertaining, and it's nice, and he's a great gossip writer. But if you want to know what's happening to our government and what Trump is doing to you, and you want to arm yourself with facts that you are seeing, if you've seen them in the news, mostly just disglancingly, not as a focus, you need to read my book. You can get it at the library. You don't have to buy it necessarily, but read it so that you understand what is being done to our government by this manifestly unqualified, criminal, cocaine trafficking pal, pal of a cocaine trafficking ignoramus named Donald Trump. So thank you. <laughs>